people ask me, when you look at me, do you see a brain? Yeah, I do. I mean, like, I'm a neuroscientist. I see you guys as having brains. But does that mean I see you as not having a soul? No, it doesn't mean that at all. Do I know how the brain works? No, I will definitely die not knowing how the brain works. It doesn't matter. I got a PhD in neuroscience. It's just too complicated, too miraculous, too amazing. And so the principles I've learned from the Bible, the things that I learned from Jesus and how to treat people, I think that's something that's irrefutable. Hello, and welcome to More Than Sunday, a weekly podcast where we take a deeper dive into the stories, themes, and questions of our faith. My name is Eric Chikowski. I'm one of the worship directors here at First United Methodist Church Richardson, and it's great to be with you today. Josh Fitzpatrick, one of our associate pastors and the usual co-host of this show, will join us later for the interview, but this week has been a little bit different for us. As most of you probably know by now, we had a severe weather system blow through Dallas on Sunday evening accompanied by a tornado that caused extensive amounts of damage in certain parts of Dallas. As a result of some school closings, people without power, and our church staff and members working to identify and help those who were affected by the storm, our production schedule has understandably been thrown off a little bit this week, but we'll be glad to welcome Josh back in for the interview as we were able to pre-record the interview for this episode. If you're looking for ways to help those affected by the storm, at this time we want to direct helping hands and hearts to supporting the efforts of Network for Community Ministries over the days and weeks to come with additional food pantry items or funds. So often with an event like this or a catastrophe like this, their needs, their demands for the services they provide are elevated. And so we would point you in their direction and you can find out information about their work and how you can help this cause at their website, www.thenetwork.org. While we know and acknowledge that efforts around the city and around the community are being undertaken to help rebuild and provide hope to those who are negatively affected, we also strongly believe in the mission of this podcast and are encouraged to continue sharing stories, themes, and questions of our faith. In that spirit, I'm still super excited about our conversation today. I've always been a math and science-oriented person. I love to ask questions about motivation and why we do the things that we do, why our emotions affect us in certain ways, how we logic and reason. And because of that, I'm thrilled to welcome our guest today, professor of neuroscience from the University of Texas at Dallas and a First United Methodist Church member, Dr. Michael Kilgar. Today on the podcast, we are honored to be able to interview the Margaret Fond Johnson Professor of Neuroscience from University of Texas at Dallas, Dr. Michael Kilgard. Dr. Kilgard, it is a joy to have you here today. It's good to be here. So we're just going to dive into it and set some context for our listeners who don't know who you are. Would you mind telling us a little bit about your journey into neuroscience and the steps that you've taken to get to where you are today? Sure. It's been a little bit of a long journey. It began just being a kid down in Houston, Texas, growing up chasing bugs and catching turtles and things like that. As I made my way through adolescence, I noticed what many people notice, which is a lot of people have serious neurological and psychiatric disorders. My grandmother had Alzheimer's disease. One of my cousins was strangled at birth and had severe brain damage. And as I went through my journey at at church and in my community, I continued to run into people who were really struggling with things that I was blessed not to be struggling with. And that got me interested in biology and eventually in the brain. And so now my full-time job is to develop new treatments for people who are suffering. Now, you mentioned church as well. You and your family are members here at the church at First United Methodist Richardson, and we love having y'all as members. In fact, your daughter was a participant in leading our modern worship service just a few weeks ago, and I know you guys serve in a lot of ways. I would imagine that we have a handful of listeners who are more familiar with the field of neuroscience, but if you're like me, and I don't want to speak for you, Josh, but if you're like Josh, yeah, you, uh, could say that you, fairly you as probably well. conceptually have a lot of questions about some things. Would you mind telling us, maybe for starters, about the concept of brain plasticity? Sure. So we used to think that the brain was like a telegraph system, that there was a point connection from one location to another location, and if the wire was cut from one spot to another, they would lose the communication. What we found after people had problems like stroke was that there's a lot of recovery. Right away after a stroke, people lose the ability to speak or move their arm, but over time they get better. And We really struggled to understand how do they get better. But then we thought about it some more and we thought, I wasn't able to shoot baskets or shoot 
you know, targets with my bow and arrow until I practiced. And so what we discovered over time was that the same processes that are allowing you to learn to read, which takes days and weeks and even years, are also making changes in the brain in the same way as the processes that help you recover from an injury, whether it's traumatic brain injury or loss of an arm or whatever other thing happens to you. We're able to have this remarkable ability to adapt and overcome adversities and learn new things that we really, our bodies weren't prepared for and yet our brain is prepared for. And so a lot of your research is in addressing certain brain traumatic events. Part of this and the training has to do with nerve stimulation. Would you mind telling us a little more about that developing field of bioelectronics? Sure. So the first idea was rehabilitation. And so if the brain is plastic and can change, then what you need to do if you lose the ability to move your arm is just practice moving your arm over and over and over again. And that's what people do. People make a lot of progress. They get better, they get stronger, they get faster, but typically the impairment is still there. And so even with extensive rehabilitation, even when you want to get better, you may not be able to get up out of the wheelchair and walk. So we've been looking for additional methods to add on to traditional rehabilitation to make it work more quickly and more completely. And one of the methods we started with were drugs, pharmaceuticals that might stimulate the brain's ability to change. And the problem with something that stimulates the brain's ability to change, if you take it as a drug, is a drug is on all the time. After you swallow it, it gets into your brain and bubbles around. We were looking for something that would come on at the moments of learning. So when I'm swinging my tennis racket and I get an ace, I want to learn that. I don't want to learn all the other times when I made a mistake. Mm. I don't want to learn all the times when birds are flying by, and other sounds are happening. So learning is really about seconds, moments in time when you pick up something new. And drugs don't get us to that moment-by-moment -moment timing. When you stimulate a nerve, you feel it. It happens at exactly that moment. But there are some nerves in your body that when you stimulate them, you don't feel them because they're unconscious. And we've been activating a nerve in the neck called the vagus nerve. And when you activate it, you don't feel it because it's sending signals from your stomach and your intestines and your heart and lungs. And you're not normally aware of any of that. But when you activate it, it does wake you up because your body thinks something exciting just happened, like maybe you just had a little short heart attack. And that triggers all the chemicals that help the brain learn and adjust, and we've shown help it recover better from spinal cord injury and other kinds of brain damage. And so when you're doing these treatments, are you stimulating the nerve at the same time that you're doing something physically? That's exactly right. So we can do the exact same amount of stimulation a couple hours later, it does no good. We can even do the same stimulation a few seconds later and it does no good whatsoever. Wow. It needs to be on those moments, like I said, with the serve. And so we can measure someone's hand as they're opening and closing it and see that one was a little better than the last one. And like a really good music coach or a really good football coach, I can give you that feedback, but I've got a connection, not just for my words of saying, great job. I've got a connection directly to your brain by stimulating wirelessly a device I've put into the neck. That then triggers these neurotransmitters directly, and that helps animals and now people recover in a way that they can't otherwise. Now, your work is specifically focused around recovery. Have there been experiments or research done in other areas that folks might find benefit to this sort of positive reinforcement to particular skills that they're trying to develop? It's a great question. A lot of people will say, I wish I had this when I was on the you know, right. golf course. Yeah. I wish I was better right. at putting. Yes. Or I have a wicked is. slice. I could <laughs> use it. Yeah. Exactly. So, so here's the situation. In principle, it seems reasonable that you could make somebody better at anything if you made the brain change more. But the reality ends up being it's harder to make a really good system better than it is to make a broken system better. Okay. So some of the funding that we've received from the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency is to do exactly what you said, to find a way to make people who are taking a long time to learn, let's say you're trying to learn Farsi, it takes you a long time to learn a language like that. Could we do it in half the time? So one of the projects we had was to explore that. And the long short of it is, it appears that your brain is so good that adding this little bit of electrical stimulation doesn't really help. It might help a little, but it sort of disturbs it a little bit, and you're just mucking up a system that's really working well. When you're learning a language, it turns out if you were to go to Iran and spend time listening to Farsi, you'd learn in about two years. It's sort of amazing. You wouldn't like it. It'd be really hard. You'd be mm -hmm. really embarrassed. But with the proper motivation and exposure, you will learn any language in two years at any age. It's sort of amazing. Kids will learn it in two years, but we say, oh, two years of kids' time, that's really fast. But if it's two years of my time, I said, that's really long. Mm. But you'd be amazed if you went to another country and just spent time at a friend just in the Peace Corps. She came back with a very, very rare African language that she now knows. 
and she tries to find the eight or ten people in America who know how to speak it. But she was able to pick it up in the two years that she was in West Africa. So the point is, you're too good to need my technology. Interesting. When you have an injury where you can't feel right with your hand and you can't move right and you can't think about things right because you've had brain damage in that area, you need a little help because wanting to get better is not enough. My mom said, if you put your mind to it, you can do anything. That's true, but if you have a hole in your head due to you know, loss of brain cells, it's just a lot harder. But what we've found is there's usually plenty of other cells in the area that you could make more gains than you would normally make. And that's true regardless of whether the type of injury, whether it's traumatic brain injury or ischemic where you have a loss of blood flow or even a brain bleed. And we've done it also with nerve damage and spinal cord injury. So we're now in the process of rolling that out to people and running clinical trials and implanting them with these devices and pairing it with the rehabilitation and thus far seeing really good outcomes. Wow. Now, you mentioned very, very briefly in in passing in that comment, defense work. You actually do some work with the Department of Defense. Would you, whatever you're allowed to tell, (laughs) would you you expand a little bit on what, yeah, that's right, uh, on what your role is with them and some of the work that you do? Sure. So we got caught off guard when Sputnik appeared over our country and the federal government decided that we would never be surprised again. So we started this agency to make sure that we were aware of what was possible. And this group tries lots of things that don't work. So the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, allows you to do things that are not guaranteed to work. They're allowed to do things that fail. And so a lot of the things we've been doing looked unlikely to work. We've had a lot of success, which is quite good. I told you about the project to accelerate learning. That hasn't worked out so well. And they're happy to find out it doesn't work because you don't have to worry that your competition's going to have it, and we aren't. Hmm. Wow. But another project we have, and these are several separate multi-million dollar grants, is really trying to explore post-traumatic stress disorder. So in post-traumatic stress disorder, you're talking about a pathology, a problem, a broken system. There's fear that isn't helpful. And so we've been using the same approach, take traditional rehabilitation. And the way rehabilitation works for post-traumatic stress disorder is you sit down with a therapist and you rehearse and review the moments that are most terrifying, and you eventually gain control over your response to it. So it's called prolonged exposure therapy. It takes a long time. Many, 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 many hours. It's not much fun to do. It's the hallmark of post-traumatic stress disorder is to avoid the thing that reminds you of those things. So people don't get the brain plasticity they need to get over it because they're avoiding it, not thinking about it. They're not going to those places. They're not talking to those people. They're not smelling those smells. They quickly learn to avoid it. And in our modern society, it's pretty easy to avoid situations you don't want. And so isolation is a real problem. When we add activation of the vagus nerve, we do two things. One, we make it where they don't need to go through it as many times. It's faster to get over. It's called extinction learning, where you learn that something that used to be really bad isn't bad now. I'm not in a war zone. I'm not with my assailant. I'm in a a safe place. In addition, the vagus nerve I mentioned connects to your abdominal cavity, your guts and your heart and your lungs, and it activates what's called the parasympathetic system. So the parasympathetic system is the rest and digest, the opposite of the sympathetic system, which is the fight or flight. So this is helping you stay calm in your body while telling your brain to learn something. And the thing you're learning is, I didn't get attacked. Nothing bad happened. It's okay. I can deal with these emotions. Most people are not really worried about being attacked. They're really worried about having a panic attack and embarrassing themselves in front of their friends and colleagues. Mm -hmm. And that's a real fear because it happens. We can help them get over that and gain better control of their body's response to those triggers. And so we're excited to begin with Baylor University Medical Center down in Dallas. Mark Powers down there is going to be running these first studies. We haven't begun recruitment yet, but we've began most of the initial approval processes and hope to start that in the spring of 2020. Wow. There's a lot to digest there. I'm struck by two things specifically. Number one, the fact that a lot of the work that you're doing isn't just for physical trauma rehabilitation, but for mental and emotional trauma as well, and that you're finding correlations in both kinds of those trauma, that the stimulation of the vagus nerve and some of the other work that you're doing is proving to be really successful in some ways. The other thing I'm fascinated by is just the philosophy that many of the projects that you work on are sort of, I don't want to say destined to fail, but what a almost refreshing philosophy to be given an opportunity to do work that you go, this probably isn't going to work. And everyone's okay with that. (laughs) Um, I, I feel like that's probably a really rare thing in our society that I would think would feed me creatively and sort of, you know, let's just think way, way, way outside the box. We had Len Wilson on the podcast in season two 
and he has several books on creativity and the creative process, and I think he would probably be fascinated by that too. But just the ability and opportunity, really, to be so outside the box in even coming up with what the project is and then really being able to go down the path and see it to fruition and probably see it fail, but maybe not. Yeah, they talk about blue sky thinking a lot. Yeah. They talk about outside the box thinking, and it really is a lot of fun. Normally when I go to the government to ask for funds, the National Institute of Health, it's a very laborious peer-reviewed process with anonymous committees of people and evaluations in multiple stages, and that's good for certain things, making sure the quality is high and there's a good rationale, but it's slow and it's unlikely to pick things that are risky. And so we have both processes in our government. We've got some individual people making these decisions. So the program managers at DARPA, it's one guy. He's only there for two to four years, and then he's back out. Mm. So they constantly turn them over. So they got new ideas, and, and some of the ideas are a little wilder than others. One of the ones they're working on, not my work, is a little tiny creature that grows all over the world, but in particular in mosses. It's called a water bear. It's a little tiny creature. If you look under an electron microscope, it's really small and cool, but it can withstand the vacuum of space and tolerate massive amounts of radiation and great colds and heats, and it's just a tough animal. And so there's a whole project just to study huh. this crazy little creature that's ridiculously strong, even though it's at a molecular scale, and the idea is what could we learn to make better body armor or better resilience or better skin replacements or whatever else lessons could be learned. So it is fun to go to something like that. On the other side, it's humbling, right? You know that you're working for our Defense Department trying to make sure that we're all kept safe and that the issues that are high priorities for them, and post-traumatic stress disorder is obviously one of them, that we take those things really seriously. So it's kind of this combination of it's real practical. we got to get these things done. We have this problem. So they're not just picking crazy things to do. They invented the Internet because they needed communication to work better. But they've had a lot of things that didn't work because they weren't possible. And it is fun to know that if you fail, it, it isn't possible, that that's a reasonable outcome. And so that is very freeing and allows you to be a lot more creative. Now, your time, obviously, your gifts are in high demand. You are also the associate director of the Texas Biomedical Device Center. What does that role entail? So there's different departments in an academic institution, and different people do different things. So engineers build things, and scientists explore hypotheses, and clinicians treat people with problems. We need all three of those things together. And so to span the different departments and even the different schools, you can create a center that allows those people to all play together without the boundaries that departments create. So I direct a group of people, it's about 150 people, all actively engaged in research, trying to find new ways to develop treatments for people with these serious neurological and psychiatric disorders. Most of them are undergraduates, so they're students at UTD who might want to be doctors or dentists or lawyers or whatever, but they feel like just taking classes is going to get them book knowledge and they should really get a chance to get their hands dirty and learn things. So many of them are coming in for 10, 20 hours a week and learning what is it like to be a scientist. Many of them are getting their PhD. Many of them already have their PhD and are advanced. And of course, it's a bunch of different faculty, whether that's physicians or engineers or, or neuroscientists or computer scientists, all working together to build these tools so that we can send people home with a therapy that really works. And so it's really a lot of fun to have all these different disciplines mixing together in one group. So you are a leader in the field of tinnitus, and the first question is going to be how to pronounce that. Is it tinnitus or tinnitus? But I, I just want to know more about your research in there and what you've learned over the course of your career and the successes that you've had. So first of all, is it tinnitus or is it tinnitus? I like tinnitus. A lot of people like tinnitus. You okay. can go either way. You're all right. Potato, potato. So a lot of people have heard ringing of the ears, a little sound. Most of us, you hear it and it goes away. It's a little bit strange. You know that it's not real. It's not a hallucination, but it's just a weird sound, sometimes a tone. Sometimes it could be noise bursts. Some people will hear crickets. One woman told me she heard birds chirping in a cave. So she could hear the echoes of it, very yeah. specific sounds. Some people hear music and other things. But in general, it's a part of the brain that's overactive. It's usually overactive because of damage to the ear. So when you listen to loud sounds, some of the cells in the ear are lost, and the brain says, wait a minute, I'm not hearing anything. So it does what you do when your radio doesn't work. You turn up the volume. The problem with turning up the volume is you can get feedback. And feedback, that sound when you put the microphone next to the speaker, sure. can happen in the brain too. And so we've been trying to find ways to turn that down. For some people, they hear it and they're okay with it. Uh, in Tibet, it's viewed as you're hearing the universe. And people are very okay with it. They go, mm. that's so great. I've gotten older and I am hearing the universe. This is fantastic. But for many of us, especially in this country, it can be very distressing. It can make you feel like you're crazy. It can make you feel like you've got a tumor in your brain. It makes you feel very vulnerable, and it makes it hard to concentrate, and in particular to sleep. So it can be very distressing. The more you concentrate on it, 
for many people, the louder it gets, the more distressing it is. So what we've done is to develop a treatment, again, using vagus nerve stimulation, where we play sounds that are higher than the tone that you hear and lower than the tone that you hear to tell the brain these other sounds are more important. They're not on all the time. That thing that's on all the time, beep, that's uninteresting. You should ignore that part. Don't focus on it at all. Strengthen the parts that go whatever, other sounds. And so people sit down, put on headphones, listen to low and high sounds. They don't hear the sound near their tinnitus frequency. And so by competition, by strengthening all the other parts of the brain, you can push down the hyperactive area. In some people, it doesn't work perfectly. About half the people get about half better. That's great, 25% improvement. But we've got a long ways to go to make it really a cure. But it's a different approach. Rather than turning on background noises to kind of hide it, it's still there. As soon as you turn the background noise off, back there. So rather than treating the symptoms, we're trying to treat the underlying cause, which turns out to be hard because you can't change all the other neurons that have got all your memories and your abilities and skills. You have to be careful. That is just fascinating. And as I'm hearing you talk about it, I almost feel myself going, yeah, I actually kind of understand this. Like, this is making sense to me. Can I go back and ask a foundational question? You keep referring to the vagus nerve. Why the vagus nerve? And how did you discover that that was the particular nerve that would lead to all of these successful treatments? Yeah. I always find my glasses the last place I look. So the vagus nerve was the last thing I looked at. Okay? <laughs> oh, really? So I tried lots of things that didn't work. Sure. And so we tried amphetamine and nicotine and cocaine and other drugs that could stimulate. I started with deep brain stimulation back when I was in San Francisco. But I thought, people probably don't want a big electrode shoved down deep in their brain to mm-hmm. get to these areas. It worked, but it didn't seem safe enough. The pills were easy to take and inexpensive, but they didn't have the timing I need. And so I went back to the idea, how would you get to electrical stimulation, but in a manner that wouldn't require going into the brain? And so there's a lot of nerves that go into the brain. And so you can go through them all, but I started with safety. So there's already 80,000 people receiving vagus nerve stimulation for the treatment of epilepsy. So for complicated reasons, when you stimulate that nerve, it also releases the same neurochemicals, and those chemicals can stop a seizure. And so again, About 50% of people with seizure that can't be treated by drugs, if you give them vagus nerve stimulation, their amount of seizures will be reduced by about 50%. So that's a lot. If you're having four seizures a day to only have two is fantastic. So we knew it was safe. And they were getting stimulated 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 30 seconds on, five minutes off, 30 seconds on. It's a lot of stimulation. Wow. We do a lot less, like 100 times less, 500 times less, because we're only doing it during rehabilitation. And when you're finished, you never need it again is the goal. You're going to fix this problem. You're not going to do it permanently. So we're not just masking the symptom, stopping seizures. We're actually treating the underlying cause of the weakness of the hand or the fear of the sound. And so that was the reason. Trying all the other things that didn't work, necessities of other invention. The problem is obvious. People are struggling with these issues. The solutions I had didn't work. So you just keep trying until you find something that does. So you and I share an experience, and I'm intrigued as to how maybe you feel like it affected you. You're an Eagle Scout. How do you think that experience in earning that award set you up for your future, for a successful future, or just for what you're doing right now? Yeah, I'm a big fan of the outer doors. I'm a big fan of character development. When things are too easy, it's not the real world. Mm -hmm. Things are going to get hard, and so I got rained on, I got cut, I got stitches, I got all kinds of things. (laughs) And a lot of people think maybe this is child abuse, sending children unprepared out in the wilderness. So we're not totally unprepared. We, we told them what not to do. And then they did it and got burned and whatever else. And so for me, it was a formative experience to be able to leave my parents behind for a weekend. And for me, it was a safe situation. And nowadays, we've made all additional ways of making sure that you've got checks and balances in place. And so it's a super exciting program. You probably know they've recently added girls into the program. Girls have been in the Explorer Scouts for 30 years now. I took my son last spring break to sea base in Florida. We got to just go scuba dive every single day. And there's girls and boys on the boats, always have been. And so just that ability to get outside of the classroom. For me as a scientist to have young people only train on multiple choice tests, it's just a little limiting. It's good, but it's a little limiting that there's always an A, a B, a C, and a D. And I have a lot of students who come in and they just have trouble tackling problems and thinking outside the box. They have trouble with leadership and organizational skills. And when you tell the boys, good luck, get these 40 or 80 kids to this place on this time, and you guys got to plan it, and we step back and watch that process happen. It's really fun. They struggle, which is great, and they eventually succeed, which is also great. And so I was able to have that same opportunity, and it really helps. I got an Eagle Scout in my lab at the moment, and he's doing great. 
And so I just have been pleased with that process. It's not for everyone. It's a lot of work. We've got a lot of other priorities. But when I've seen people really put their heart and soul into the program, I've really gotten a lot out of it. Now, apparently you're also locally famous for your dissection demonstrations that you do at neighborhood block parties on an annual basis. <laughs> uh, how, how did this come to fruition? What, what, tell us about this. Yeah, so when you don't have any musical skills, so everyone on my street is in a band or supports the band okay. or does something else, I have zero musical skills. I cannot carry a tune in a bucket. No one in my family did. People would move away from us at church when I was a kid. <laughs> Could you use Vegas uh, nerve stimulation it's to address possible. that? It's possible. It's <laughs> possible. I need something for sure. Uh, and so we were organizing a block party to close the street down. Everyone get together and listen to a band. We'd bring in professionals, but then also all the members on our street jamming together, which is just a lot of fun. I like community organizing organizations and making connections that way. And I made a joke. I said, well, you know, I'm not really that good at very many things. I, I could dissect something. And somebody said, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> and so just on a lark, I went online and ordered a, you know, a dead animal. And I had no idea if anyone would have any interest in this thing. This is kids playing hula hoops and blowing bubbles and eating snow cones, right? What does this have to do with the kidneys and the lungs and the heart and everything else? It turns out that if you've got children between three and about eight and you open up a present they've never been able to see inside, they want to look. They can't look away. And so the older people are often turned off. They go, oh, it's got blood. It's got this. It's got that. There's some shrieking and stuff. But the young kids just love it. And if you keep doing this year after year after year, they're no longer young kids anymore. <laughs> they're now 16 and 17 and 18 year olds who've been doing this for you know eight or nine and 10 years. And so if you've done it a lot of times, seeing an internal organ is not stressing, it's beautiful. And so we've done pigs and horses and cows and sheep. We've done horseshoe crabs one year. I had done everything in the catalog of the internet company I use and I called them up and I said, do you have anything else that's not in the catalog? I said, no. And I said, well, if you come up with something, give me a call. And they called me the next day and said, well, we have this snake. Uh, it's eight feet long. Would you like it? And I said, yeah, yeah, sure. Give me the snake. No. And so it's a Brazilian boa constrictor that somehow ended up in their preserved specimen space, just a one-off. Wow. Uh, and I said, wait, how much does it cost? I said, that's 40 bucks. I said, done. So <laughs> no that's great. Way. And so I was able to take this enormous animal apart. And now everyone wants me to outdo oh, the yeah. eight-foot Brazilian boa constrictor, yes, which is not that's doable. set the bar. Exactly. So that's my challenge now. I'm going, look, we're going to do the pig again. And there's some four-year-old who's never seen the pig, and so we're going to do the pig. But the kids like to see the eye, and they like to see the brain, and they like to see how babies are made. They like to see where the food comes in. At one time, I was illustrating how the mouth goes to the stomach. So I shoved my finger down in the shark's throat, and I could see my finger wiggling out in the but then I had to get my finger back out, and uh, those uh, those teeth are pointed in. Oh, <laughs> no. And I really came back with a bloody finger, and I learned a lesson. Uh, Don't stick your finger down a shark's mouth yeah, and expect it to good. come back unbloodied. So, again, they're learning lessons. They're seeing me make mistakes, but it's really fun to see kids say, ooh, that's gross. And then, well, everyone else is watching. I guess I'll just come watch. And so not to be afraid of their bodies and know that there's parts inside that are miraculous and amazingly well-built and designed. And uh, that's a lot of fun for me. And it's something I'm good at. It's funny for me to hear you talk about, well, I didn't have any musical talent, so I thought I made a joke about, oh, I can dissect something. I joke with people all the time. Well, I, I play the guitar for a living. I know four chords really well. And here you are, you know, doing work for the Defense Department and incredible work. And it's always funny to me, you know, to hear that, you know, there are spots for all of us. <laughs> that's right. Um, that's exactly. and, uh, but neat that you can still be putting what you do really well to entertainment value as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, Dr. Kilgard, what is your hope for the future of neuroscience and how it continues to impact the world? Yeah, I think people mostly don't think about the brain at all. It used to be that we thought the brain disease was caused by demons and it's something we should be afraid of. It used to be we thought we should ostracize people who were suffering. And now the next generation of kids... They treat children with autism fantastically. They just they love and care on them. They know that they're different. Oh, he's got Down syndrome. Awesome. I know what that is. I know what the prognosis is, and I know how I'm going to treat people. It's just fantastic. So the first generation is understanding, and not understanding is bad, and understanding is good. And so we've made it through that process. The decade of the brain was declared by Congress in the 1990s, so we know a lot about the brain now. But in terms of fixing those things, we're just not there yet. And so we know that the tires are coming off the car, but we don't know how to replace the tires. And so we're moving to a next generation now where we might be able to intervene and do things that were impossible before. My mentor in San Francisco, Mike Merzik, is one of the developers of the cochlear implant. And here's people who are just deaf, can't hear anything, no sound whatsoever. Stick this thing in the ear, flip it on, and they can hear. It's just a miracle. Like, there's no way to call it anything else. It wasn't possible. It's now possible. It doesn't work perfectly. 
You can't say, you know, it's just as good music and a cochlear implant sounds terrible. Like it just sounds bad. But you can understand what people are saying and you can have communications and you can go to a normal telephone in a normal restaurant and be with your family. So to me, those things are still possible. We don't know what's going to be impossible. We don't know what's going to take 50 years and what's going to take five years. But the idea that we're making progress and the idea that as a community, we continue to value this work, that we think there's something that can be done and should be done and that our country wants to lead in this area is all very exciting to be a part of. I think it's incredible to hear the potential that neuroscience has. Even speaking of the cochlear implant, we have a young man who attends our modern worship service every Sunday, and he has cochlear implants. And we've been able to use his transmitter and plug it directly into our soundboard to give him a more direct ability to hear what's going on during the service, which is absolutely incredible. I'm curious, as a person of faith, how has your work in neuroscience made an impact on your own faith? Yeah, I mean, people ask me, when you look at me, do you see a brain? Yeah, I do. I mean, like, I'm a neuroscientist. I see you guys as having brains. But does that mean I see you as not having a soul? No, it doesn't mean that at all. Do I know how the brain works? No, I will definitely die not knowing how the brain works. It doesn't matter. I got a PhD in neuroscience. It's just too complicated, too miraculous, too amazing. And so the principles my grandmother taught me are all true. I use those, get a lot of sleep, you know, all these new ideas. Neuroscience aren't really teaching teachers how to be better teachers. And the principles I've learned from the Bible, the things that I learned from Jesus and how to treat people, the miracles he's performed, stand the test of time. And so to me, it's exciting that the prediction was made many years ago, that when we become more scientifically literate, we will become less faith-based. And that has not happened. It's a strong prediction made by a reasoned atheist. It just didn't turn out to be true. We know a lot more about the brain. We know about quasars and interstellar space and quantum mechanics and all that stuff. And it doesn't make you go, aha, no need for God. It all makes sense now. And so to me, that's really impactful. I know that many religious faiths are now embracing neuroscience and understanding that it doesn't make you a robot because you've got neurons that do things any more than makes you a robot because you've got a heart that beats. And so the idea that how we think, what we spend our time on, Jesus talks very clearly that what your thoughts are matter. They're not just little things that rattle around in your head. They matter. And we now know that they change you. So having effective spiritual practices and spiritual discipline makes a difference. If you're doing things that are bad for you, they're bad for you. You should stop doing them, whether that's not sleeping enough or perseverating on worries and and things that are not helpful. Letting things go and giving them to God is a good idea. Like, try it. It works. (laughs) And I think that's something that's irrefutable. And so I think there's no longer a conflict The Dalai Lama is big into neuroscience, spends a lot of time understanding, really, you could sit and meditate and change your brain? Yeah, you totally can do that. That's really exciting because it could have been that you couldn't. It could have been that you're just a machine and just a box, but that isn't what we're discovering. We're seeing things change as you form new relationships, as you read and practice, and even as you visualize and think about things and pray for others. So to me, that's a surprise as a scientist. I'm going to follow where the truth leads. Jesus said the way the truth and the light. It's what's the truth. I shouldn't avoid looking at the brain. It's just sitting there. And I was given gifts that allowed me to look. Why would I want to look away? And every time I look, I see more miraculous characteristics. I love being a human, being a person, being a parent more than I did before. And so I think there's no conflict whatsoever in my life. It's amazing to me to hear through the lens of a neuroscientist that you see physical transformation through practices that are encouraged in Scripture and, you know, your references to the Dalai Lama and to Jesus and these other areas that this truth has been preached for a long, long time, but you can scientifically measure the results in a positive way in people's lives. And I do think that's a fascinating conversation for another day, but I'd love to hear you speak on that. So thank you for mentioning that. We have one more question that we ask every guest that comes on the podcast. And that question is this, up until this point in your life, what is one thing that you wish someone would have told you? Oh, man, I'm not good at regrets. I don't have a lot of things I feel like I've missed out on. Something I wish someone had told me. Um, I wished that I had been told to pay attention to the joy of looking at something about a foot away from your face without glasses. I've always had good vision, enjoyed it every day. I went to the doctor and he told me, in a year, you won't be able to see things that are in your hands. And he was right to the day it was gone. And now I have to wear glasses, and I feel bad for all the people who wore glasses since they were little kids. They're just a pain. I hated them, and I wished I had looked at things up close more often. Wow, that's good. I like that. I don't wear glasses. Do you wear glasses? Yeah, I do. You do wear glasses. You're just not wearing them right now? I'm not. I'm going to have to take that into account. Yep, the scientific invention of contact lenses. It's a miracle, right? It's a miracle, and you can see. Everything's fuzzy. Unbelievable, unbelievable. 
Well, hey, Dr. Kilgard, this has been so much fun. And I don't know if I'm lying to myself, but I feel smarter on this side of the conversation than when I began. And so I appreciate your grace with us novices in the room and speaking in layman's terms. But really, this was a rich conversation. We just really appreciate your time. Thank you for coming on the show today. Happy to be here. often happens in these conversations. I found myself way out of my league from an intellectual and academic standpoint, but I really appreciated Dr. Kilgard's ability to speak in terms that I could understand about the ways that the brain works and about how our thoughts and actions can actually physically affect the way that our brain functions. What was once seen as a potential barrier to the Christian faith or maybe a reason to disregard it entirely, Dr. Kilgard reminded us that the more he learns about the brain and the more that he learns about science, the more evident the workings of God are and the truths that have been in scripture for thousands of years may perhaps actually be better understood as we know more about science. That the way our bodies grow and learn change and evolve might actually be manifestations of God's workings and miracles in our lives. If you want to find out more about UTD and the School of Behavioral and Brain Sciences, you can visit our website at fumcr.com slash more than Sunday. I want to leave you today with a quote that I think encapsulates the spirit of our conversation. This quote is attributed to Arthur Compton, who's a Nobel laureate in physics. He says, for myself, Faith begins with the realization that a supreme intelligence brought the universe into being and created man. It is not difficult for me to have this faith, for it is incontrovertible that where there is a plan, there is intelligence. An orderly, unfolding universe testifies to the truth of the most majestic statement ever uttered. In the beginning, God. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of More Than Sunday. If you like the podcast, please feel free to share it, go online and leave a comment, or give us a rating so that others might hear about us. We've got a new episode coming out every Wednesday, so make sure you also subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss our next episode. If you want to find out more about First United Methodist Church Richardson, you can find us online at fumcr.com, as well as on Facebook and Instagram. Special thanks to Dr. Michael Kilgard for joining us this week, and make sure you tune in next Wednesday. Have a great week.